Alright guys, so flour. This is wholemeal flour, meaning it contains a whole grain. It's the whole wheat berry ground down with no extraction, or minimal extraction at least. So extraction means they take out as much or a certain amount of the germ and bran that's in flour and leave the endosperm to get something like white flour, an all-purpose flour. This is unbleached, by the way, a great flour. So anyway, the bran is the outer layer of the wheat berry. That's where the natural yeast is, that's where the amylase enzyme mostly is. Um, and it's really good for fermentation. The more bran usually helps fermentation. Uh, the germ is the core of the seed of the wheat berry. So that's when that gets hydrated, that helps with the germination process. And uh, that process aids in fermentation as well. Um, the endosperm, which takes up majority of the wheat berry, will have the, the protease enzyme and the proteins that form gluten when they get hydrated. So white flours are more gluten forming, wholemeal flours activate fermentation more. So when flour gets hydrated, a lot of different things happen. Two main things happen. So your gluten will form because the proteins that are in flour, there's two of them, two main ones at least, which are glutenin and gliadine. Glutenin is the primary protein that's gluten forming. Uh, gliadine is the secondary protein that's gluten forming. So if you have a 14% flour and it's 100% gliadine, it might not be as strong as a 10% protein flour that's primarily or all lieutenant. Um, so those are your two proteins. You have two main enzymes in flour as well. You have your protease enzyme, that is your gluten forming enzyme, which basically is a catalyst for the gluten bonds to form. And then you also have your amylase enzyme, which comes in a couple forms, but just remember amylase enzyme. And what that does when that gets hydrated, it acts as a catalyst to break down the complex sugars and flour, which are starches and carbohydrates, into simple sugars, which aid in the caramelization of your dough, as well as a food supply for your yeast to carry on fermentation. Um, let's see, moving on. Yeah, so your glutenin protein, it gets hydrated and catalyzed by the protease enzyme. Um, it's responsible for the elasticity and extensibility of your dough. Extensibility is basically how far you can stretch it before it breaks, and elasticity is more related to the resistance of how much it wants to bounce back. So if you hear me say extensible, know that I'm talking about how far it wants to stretch, which is a property of gluten and also elasticity referring to how much resistance it wants to bounce back which is another property of gluten. So the bran of the flour is also really good to act as a lube like where you would use semolina or cornmeal you can also use bran to a certain extent. It's what I call a solid lube for launching a pizza or launching loaves of bread and things like that. So it has multiple uses. For instance, uh, corn has a ton of uses as is. So to use cornmeal might not be as good for the environment as using a wheat-based form of that, such as semola, semolina, or wheat bran. Once again, the germ is the seed core. It's rich in nutrients, um, and its germination qualities will aid fermentation. So once again, your endosperm is where the gluten-forming proteins and the protease enzyme mostly reside. The endosperm is mostly what takes up white flour and even wholemeal, there's 
more endosperm than German bran. So, if I have flour and water, and they mix, just the two of them, no salt, no yeast, or commercial yeast at least, when that happens, the flour touches the water. The protease enzyme will catalyze the gluten formation, which will, over time, get stronger and stronger and stronger, and that's what we call autolysis or autolysis. And that's why some people swear by it in their baking process, which means they'll mix just the flour and water first, and then add in their, say, sourdough starter, their poolish, their yeast, their salt, whatever they want to add to their dough after they give a period of time for just the flour and water to be together. In a sourdough starter, or a sourdough levain, whatever, you're mixing just your flour and water. They're coming together, and, sorry, two things are happening. Once again, the gluten is forming, and as well, the amylase enzyme is going to start breaking down those complex sugars, and the natural yeast, as well as good bacteria, which are lactobacillus and acetobacillus. Lactobacillus is a lactic acid building bacteria, which is good for you, good for your digestive system. Same with acetic acid building bacterial or acetobacillus. Um, acetic acid is basically the vinegary notes, and the lactic acid, even though there's no dairy, can give you dairy notes. So, a wetter sourdough starter, aka 100% hydration, 200% hydration, 500% hydration, will give you much more lactic acid bacteria, uh, dairy notes, things like that, where if you get into a stiffer starter, you might get a more of an acetic or acidic or vinegary note of your starter. So you might want to play around with the stiffness of your starter as you go. And you don't always need to scale it out 100%. If you know consistencies and you know you pass the batter phase and you're in that dough phase, maybe at what might be 80% hydration, maybe that's your sweet spot for flavor and for feel and for making the dough, maybe that's what you like the best. So fermentation can be a tough topic to understand, but the easiest way I can basically put it into words is that your, your, your flour is could be a balloon or it could be a car tire. And your fermentation uh, is the gas that blows that up. So if you have a weak flour that's a really light balloon, only a little bit of fermentation will make it pop, start to deflate, and die. And that's a life cycle of the gluten forms get strong, the fermentation goes, you have this big nice bubble, balloon, whatever you want to call it, and then eventually you just can't take anymore, and it'll start to deflate. And you might feed it again, you might make it dough, adding more fresh flour and water. Um, so that's basically the best way I can put it. Overproofing would be the point where that balloon or car tire pops and deflates. When it's blowing up and blowing up, it sits, takes as much as it can take, and it deflates. That's kind of the process of your sourdough starter, as well as any dough you make. There's no dough that just keeps on going forever and forever and forever. There's a point of no return when it comes back. Oh yeah, so when I say fermentation gases, when the yeast and good bacteria, they both do this. Just so you know, mostly the yeast, but also the good bacteria, will take in the sugars that the amylase enzyme helped break down from the starches and carbohydrates and flour. It will, when it get, gets hydrated, it will become simple sugars from the amylase enzyme, and your yeast and good bacteria can feed on that once again. And what happens is they feed on that, and they will both. That'll get them to reproduce, but they'll also have a byproduct of CO2. That CO2 is the fermentation gas that blows up your bubble, basically. <clears throat> so, another good point of that would be that another thing that leads to the deflation 
would be once your yeast runs out of a food source, they can only eat so much and eat so much. Once it runs out of a food source, it's going to start to eat at your gluten network and everything like that, and that will cause the deflation as well. So, when you get into a dough, you got your flour and water situation, and just like a sourdough starter, you can use commercial yeast, which is basically, I use the word commercial because it's made in a factory, and it goes just to one strain of yeast with no real lactobacillus or acetobacillus to the one most territorial strain of yeast, which is uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And in a sourdough starter, you might get a bunch of different strains of yeast all living together, which gives a cool uh, flavor profile that's super complex and different. And just because the word is sourdough does not mean the dough or bread will be sour. You can control that. You can control that in many ways by, like I said, the hydration of your starter as well as your feeding schedule. If you wait till your starter is on its way down, almost to the bottom, and then you feed it, well, it's going to get really acidic, and then you're going to feed it, and some of that acid's going to carry on with it, and you're going to have a sour starter if you let it go all the way down to the bottom before you feed it again. If you want to have less of a sour, uh, like almost, almost flavor flavorless um, starter or leaven or dough, you'll kind of feed it. Once it sits at its peak, feed it again. Sits at its peak, feed it again. That also helps your starter become stronger and stronger. Um, and then there's like a middle point where it gets to its peak and it just starts to decline and you feed it again. That's when I like to feed my starter. So there's ways to control the time that that happens. Um, when you make a dough, the next ingredient after flour and water and the, the natural yeast and good bacteria, you're going to have your salt to make a dough. Um, you're not going to throw your salt in sourdough starter, but you will throw it in your dough. Uh, salt controls fermentation and excess amounts in direct contact can kill yeast, but it's got to be in direct contact, as in you're basically putting your yeast and your salt in a bowl together and shaking it up and adding water to that. Um, but if you have, let's say, your mass of water for your dough, you throw your salt in there and dissolve it, you throw some yeast in it and throw some flour, well, you just diluted that salt with water and flour so there won't be direct contact. Um, if you're going in baker's math for bread, 2% salt is great. For most pizza dough recipes, 2% salt is great. But if you're doing Neplatana or Napolitana style pizza, you're going to want to be in the 3% range of salt. Now, I'd never go to 4 or 5 for anything. That's where you might have a real bad dough. It might take a month to get to where it needs to be, but by then the gluten might be destroyed. You know? um, what the salt does also is control gluten development. It can make it a lot tighter, too. Um, which it might make it so tight that your fermentation just can't blow it up. Like imagine trying to manually blow up a car tire with your mouth. That's going to be very difficult. Um, so yeah, you got your salt. That controls the time it takes to ferment. And it controls tightness of your gluten. Um, temperature is huge. Uh, my apartment is goes from anywhere to 70 to 75 degrees. Sometimes slightly lower. <coughs> which is a pretty normal room temperature, but if you're in a really cold place, uh, let's say you're 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you might want to feed your starter half as often as I would, and it might take your dough twice as long to ferment as mine would. Um, throwing in the fridge, for instance, if I took my starter out of the fridge, I would have to feed it at least once a day. If I wanted to keep adding strength and strength to it, I'd feed it twice a day. Um, but when it's in the fridge, I literally just feed it once a week. That's all it really needs. 
or salt also does, it's more of a technical ingredient, but it does enhance the flavor, just like with any dish, you add a little bit of salt, you bring out a lot of flavor. And I'm not talking about saltiness, I'm talking about, for instance, my tomato sauce from my Pizza Napolitana, it's just really good tomatoes and salt, and not that much salt at all. I throw it in the fridge, I let it marinate for at least 12 hours, when it's done with that, it tastes amazing, and it tastes just like great tomatoes. Without that salt, if I just use the can, it's going to taste pretty bland and watery almost is a good way to describe it. 